We need everybody to uh, keep your social, social ability up, but to come join us now for a presentation because this is going to be really, really exciting. All of you know that, that uh, Amateur Radio World was blessed with uh, 2,200 meters as a wavelength that we could operate on. So we have someone here tonight that's going to teach you how to build a dipole for 2,200 meters and put it up a half wave above ground, and you're going to be something else. If oh, wait a minute. That's not how we do it, is it? No, not. Okay. So let me just start by saying, George, I think of George as a professor. He's told me not to call him that, but he is such a good instructor that I think of it. I wish I'd had him as a professor when I was in school. Here he is. He's going to teach you a little bit about another way to work 2,200 meters. George. Okay. I guess this one's working if I don't drop this thing. Okay. Um, well, thanks for inviting me to talk about this. So. Uh, some years ago, I was in a group called AMRAD, and we were playing around with uh, low frequencies on a uh, temporary license from the FCC. And uh, so uh, I, I found a couple of things out from working with a fellow in the area who was a consultant to the, uh, and, and a designer of these things. He's passed away now, but uh, he was uh, very knowledgeable, so I, I learned a, one or two things, I think, from him, and I'll try to impart some of that tonight. What I think... I see in a lot of the ham magazines, uh, there's, and there's more and more articles coming out about 2,200 meters, but um, in, in, to me, some of the magazine articles and things that they're putting forth are just c complicated to me. And what I'll try to do tonight is simplify this and show you what to look for, in, in my view, in these articles that are coming out about low-frequency antennas. So here we go. Um, the rules for the 2,200 meter band, and that you got don't have much channel width there. Uh, it's called 1 watt EIRP at 2200 uh, meters. And so they uh, that we're going to find that the antennas are very inefficient, so you have to put a lot of power into the antenna to get anything like that out. And they also put a restriction on us of 60 meters height for the antenna for both of those bands. It's available to general and higher. Now, there's a whole topic we could go into about low-frequency receive antennas, and we'll do that another time. But there's E-Field Probe uh, is one that's a great article in QST about that by uh, uh, K0BRA, SK now. Um, there are loop antennas, beverages, all kinds of antennas to receive. And they're a little different topic. We're, today we're going to talk about the transmit antennas. So straight away, for low frequency, you need vertical polarization for any thing in the low frequency band, you've got to do that. I don't think any of you have ever seen a broadcast AM station use a half wave dipole. There's no such thing. I all use a vertical tower and there's reason for that. So when you're at 2200 meters, a quarter wavelength is 550 meters. Uh, typical antenna for um, uh, hams might be 10 to 30 meters, I'll guess. Again, you're limited to 60. But at 10 meter height, your antenna wavelength is not a quarter of a length thing, it's 0 0.0045 wavelength, okay? And you say, well, how can that work? Well, it actually work, can work extremely well. And, I, and I'll show you, well, it, it works, okay? Let me put it that way. <laughs> uh, but all the people in the business of low frequency have that issue, and guess what? They make it work. Here's a good example. Now, some of the people in here have got those watches with the 60 kilohertz receiver on them. Here's a picture of their antenna. Now, it turns out that they used two antennas. This old one was, one of them was for 20 kilohertz and one was 60. And they got rid of the 20, but they redesigned this, and they're feeding both antennas from the same transmitter. But here's the important thing to look at up here. Um, these antennas, uh, the down lead, at, which is right there. Uh, you see this big thing? That's the top hat. The antenna is right there and right there. It's a vertical wire. And that's about 0.02 wavelength long. But look up here at the antenna efficiency. They're getting better than 50% efficient out of those antennas. Well, how do they do that? Well, they, keep, they, they mine full of losses. Okay, that's what you have to do here. Here's another antenna. There's this, this antenna still exists in Sweden. And they fire it up with a, gener uh, a thing called an alternator twice a year at 17.2. This is an old school 
antenna. You can see this patent was from 1917. This is what RCA used back in the 20s and 10s for uh, Rocky Point communication. And you know, back when all communication was on low frequency. So this antenna was the famous Alexanderson antenna. And what they were doing is in order to divide up the ground currents, he put down leads from that top hat. So there's, in this one, this is, this is called a multi-tuned antenna, meaning that each of these down leads has one-fifth of, of the inductance necessary to resonate the antenna. You match them all, get them all equal currents, and now they're all five radiating in together. It doesn't matter if they're a quarter of a mile apart. At this frequency, it looks like one wire, you know, sticking up there. Uh, but at any rate, this is a typical uh, antenna called a triadic. A triadic is just a ship term that means it's a thing that goes between the top of the two masts. So these antennas that are multiple tuned, and this, this was in vogue, I would say, up through the 40s and early 50s. And uh, another famous, there was one out at Annapolis uh, uh, that was replaced in 69. Um, uh, one of the folks here uh, has, John has a pictures of the newer antenna uh, that they replaced it with. But this is the old style. But my, again, my point is these are just short, it's a short vertical radiator. Here's a commercial antenna you can buy today. There are still people using commercial non-directional beacons for aviation, and there's a, a company in Canada I, called Nautel, and there's a company in, this company in Texas called Southern Avionics. So they sell these. This is a 30-foot. They make them much bigger. Uh, they make them for much more power. But you can see here's the vertical radiator. This is the top load capacitance. We'll see why we need that. So this is only 25 feet above ground. And they use it, this would work for 137. They put about 12 radials out. And the static capacitance, in other words, the capacitance, if you measure to this point right here, the capacitance of this antenna and the down lead to ground, it's about 870 p puffs. So that's a, that's a commercial antenna you can buy. They put these up for uh, non-directional beacons and use them. Uh, so again, we're going to talk about low frequency. Um, because at these frequencies, it's, it's interesting because most of the characteristics of these antennas could just be treated as lumped elements, capacitors, resistors, and coils. But there's a couple of terms in here you need to know when you read these articles and, and read about these antennas. And well, if they're not, I don't know that they spend much time on them in the handbook, but one of them is the so-called effective height of an antenna and the static capacitance. And with these and a couple of other things, you can predict a lot about how the antenna is going to work and what its efficiency is going to be, and that's what we're going to do tonight. So uh, here is a schematic of a short antenna. You've got the down lead. There's a wire that's got some inductance. You've got the wire and the top hat, which has capacitance. There's some resistance loss in all those wires. Uh, there's loss in the ground system. Now, we're not going to talk about ground system tonight. That's another story. We're going to pretend we have a perfect ground to simplify the story here. But that's something we can talk about another time is how would you measure that. And, how do you, and that's a, a, another thing. But it's just another thing to keep in mind. That's a loss. That's a loss. This is what we're trying to maximize, what's called the radiation resistance of the antenna. We don't pay much attention to that on a dipole because it's so good. I mean, it's hard to not get tens of ohms of radiation resistance on an antenna that you put up. And unless you make the antenna out of nichrome wire or something, the losses are so low. I mean, it's like 98% efficient probably. So you don't worry about any of those things. Here, you worry about it because your radiation resistance Distance, instead of being 35 ohms is 0.01 ohm and so how I got to get I got to get power through that radiation resistance in order to get a signal out let's talk about what the effective height is here's a picture of a vertical monopole and as you know it's a sloppy way of doing it, but this is like a cosine curve of what the current would be off of the dipole. So you inject current at the base of the antenna, it's maximum, and it goes down to a minimum at the top of the antenna. And so that's the physical height of the antenna, and that's what the, the current profile on the antenna looked like. When you have a very short antenna, you're really operating up here at this portion of the curve, and it's not a good picture, but it really is a triangular type dis uh, current distribution right across this antenna. And we're talking here about uh, antennas, you know, that are like less than a tenth of a, a way, you know, much less than a tenth of a wavelength. So uh, again, uh, let's pretend that this antenna is 100 feet. Uh, we're going to run it at 136 kilohertz, and it's 100 feet physical height. So we put some current in there. How do we know the current? Well, we, we actually put an ammeter in the, in the line. So if, if the input current to that base were constant over the whole vertical height, then the effective height would be the same as the physical height. 
So what we do in our LF antenna is we want to maximize that current on the vertical all the way up the antenna. So to do this, um, uh, we'll, we'll show how we do that, but the goal is to optimize that effective height of the antenna, not just make it taller, because if we make it taller, the current distribution still falls off. We're probably not utilizing the antenna to the maximum that we can for the given height of the tower that we have to put up, or however the long the wire is. So that's what we want to talk about is that effective height concept. So here's an, I'm going to beat it a little more here into the ground that on this very short antenna, if you had perfect uh, effective height, it would be a linear current all the way up the height of the tower. And that's the best you could do. So if we can make the average current in that vertical portion of the antenna higher without having to increase the base current, we get more power out of the antenna. And so what we do is we add top loading so that that average current is increased above the, of the center of the antenna. And that's called, if, uh, the rate, the, uh, that's called increasing the effective height of the antenna. Now, we talked about this radiation resistance, so I fibbed a little bit. This isn't probably a formula you already know. It may not be everywhere, but it's, it's out there. Uh, but we'll learn it tonight. Uh, we'll use it. So for an antenna on the order of less than a tenth of a wavelength, um, uh, the formula is here. That's the radiation resistance. So it uses the effective height of the antenna and the wavelength. And you see that this is squared. And the important thing here is that means that any, any increase I can make in the effective height of the antenna is a square to the result of the resistance, of the radiation resistance of the antenna. So you want to do everything you can to increase the effective height and don't do anything that's going to decrease it. And then how much power does the antenna radiate? Well, it's just power law. Like Ohm's law, power is I squared R. So if you know what this resistance is, it's an R value. How much current you're putting into the antenna in RF amperes, that's how much power the antenna will radiate. So here is the top-loaded antenna. And this is a common thing people do, like you saw the Southern Avionics. They put a T element up here. They use two wires, and you can use two or three, or like you saw in the triadic, they use more wires up there to increase the capacitance to ground. But what happens when you put that T element up there is the current doesn't end at the top. It goes up, and then it goes back down to zero out here on the ends. Now, this current's going that way. This one's going that way. They cancel out. So there's really no radiation, effectively, from the top of the antenna. But what you've done is you've created a place where you've put, uh, the current can go, and you've raised this current up here at the top of the antenna from where it was zero to some value. So this is the physical height. That's the input current value. There's this current distribution is now more up the height of the tower. So the effective height is now greater than half the physical height, as we saw when you don't have any top loading. So the top loading adds capacitance. This has a, a number of benefits. One of them is it, when you increase the capacitance of that antenna, remember you have to put something in series with it. It looks like a capacitor, so you have to put a loading coil in series. That's what you do on the back of your car when you have that whip with the screwdriver coil on there. You're adding inductance so that you can resonate with what capacitance there is of that antenna. And, and so increasing that capacitance on the antenna structure reduces the amount of inductance you have to put in series with the antenna to bring it into resonance. And by doing that, reducing that amount of inductance on the loading coil reduces the number of turns you have to put on there, which reduces the resistive loss in the coil. So it's, it's a win-win. And um, so it also affects your bandwidth of the antenna. And we'll talk about that later. But it's, it's again, you're affecting the Q of the antenna uh, by um, Re increasing that capacitance uh, of the antenna. And in a, in a resonant circuit, increasing a capacitance is, the, is the, an effective way to do things. So uh, another way to put that top loading is to do an umbrella. And this is very commonly done. So here you, you have guy wires to support this tower. And you can connect the guy wires electrically up here at the top of the antenna. You've got to hook, you've got to run them up there anyway. So why not? use the guy wires or a portion of the guy wires as uh, the top load. And that's very commonly done. So you'll, you don't bring them all the way down. And uh, they don't have to be all the same length. They don't have to be equally spaced. 
you can have three, four, uh, as many as you want. There's, there's limits to uh, how much it helps. The disadvantage is that the current goes up and then comes back down. Excuse me. Um, so that, to some extent, reduces the effective height. But because it's easier to build this and it only takes one tower structure rather than having to have the two out here for the T, a lot of people go with this structure uh, for the effective, uh, for increasing the effective height of the antenna. Uh, there's a trade-off uh, in these umbrella characteristics, how long these are, what their um, uh, angle is. Uh, there's some been some research already done for you. Your tax dollars at work by the Navy did this back in 66. They wrote an extensive study on how to uh, optimize this in terms of the effective height, the uh, power handling, the voltage on the antenna, things like that. So uh, th the point is, umbrella is another way to do this. Uh, this is a way you can decrease effective height. That's have a lot of shunt capacitance around the antenna. Uh, brush underneath, things like that, that are give another path. So let's go back and look at the circuit again here for the antenna. So here's the antenna inductance. It's got a wire, so it has inductance. It has capacitance, and it will resonate somewhere. In practice, on those big antennas you saw at the beginning, they generally build them so that they will re self-resonate somewhere above the uh, uh, frequency that you want. Uh, like, say, if you want to operate at 30 kilohertz, they'll resonate them at maybe 35, and then to, they'll bring just a little bit of inductance into the circuit to bring them on to resonance. Um, so at any rate, um, in our system, we would have to have some kind of antenna loading coil. It's got some loss resistance, but this is pretty much the circuit. So you're going to feed this from some kind of transmitter. Is it 50 ohms? No, it's not 50 ohms, but you can if you really want to put a 50 ohm feed out to something like this, you can, but you're going to have to transform uh, the resistance to something reasonable to, to match the line going back. Uh, one way to do it is put the transmitter out here, which is the way a lot of those NDBs and things do it. So let's do some examples. And uh, just being sure I don't get tight on time. Okay, so let's do an example here. If you have a vertical tower, it's, we'll estimate it about 5 picofarads per foot. So a 100-foot tower times 5 picofarads, 500 puffs. Then you've got top load wires at the top. Let's say they're 60 feet long, and we're going to estimate that at uh, 360. So the total capacitance of the antenna that you would measure at that at the base of the antenna, and you measure it down at something really low, like 60 cycles or something, so you're not resonating the thing and getting fooled. You want to know, they call it the static capacitance, but it's just a... Uh, 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 non-resonant reading so you know what the real capacitance is. You c if you need to increase it, you can parallel wires, things like that. I mean, space them like you saw on the Southern Avionics. So we, we got 860 picofarads. So now the capacitive reactants of the antenna, these are on the general class exam. Here's your reactance formula. You can calculate that out at 2340 ohms capacitive reactance. Now let's put the four top load wires. This is just the antenna, no top load, 100 foot tower. Just the top load is, is about 2340 ohms reactance. Now let's put four wires on there for the top load. Now it's come down to 1361. So adding capacitance lowers that capacitive an, uh, reactance of the antenna. Let's assume, now let's go back to our radiation resistance formula. Assume the effective antenna of our 100 foot antenna is 50 feet. Remember that effective height is like 50% when it's just a triangular distribution of current. So the radiation resistance is 0.077 ohms, we calculate. Now let's put the top load wires up there, and now the uh, uh, radiation resistance is 0.108 ohms. So with, with a top load, we have 1.4 times the radiation resistance we had with no top load wires. We didn't make the tower any taller, we just added the down leads. And we've doubled our radiation out of the antenna by doing that with a given current into the antenna. You see how it works? It's really, it's really all you're trying to do is increase that radiation resistance on it. So you, you're fighting with this low number, you want to make it as good as you can. So here, let's look at the efficiency of the antenna. How much power am I going to have to put into it to get 
my power out. So here's our antenna, 100 foot high, no top lights, uh, top load, so the effective height's 50 feet. Uh, we're going to estimate the coi coil Q, the, induct uh, the inductor we put in series with the antenna to resonate it at about 250. And that, that's doable. Uh, so here was our reactance. So the loss in that coil is, again, uh, uh, Q formula. Our loss is XV over Q. So you've got about 9 ohms loss in the reloading coil. That's a lot compared to your tenth of an ohm radiation resistance, isn't it? We're assuming no ground loss. But you, the way you calculate the efficiency is you take the radiation resistance um, divided or, uh, plus the uh, total resistance of the circuit and then divide uh, the radiation resistance over that. So the antenna is 0.8% efficient. That's not very good compared to your 40 meter dipole, is it, Ron? No, that's not so good. But it is what it is. So now let's put the top load on the antenna like we did. Now we've got the same loading coil Q. We're going to calculate now what is the, um, with the total resistance of this antenna, adding the loss in of the loading coil, what's the efficiency? Well, we're up to 1.9%. We're making progress, right? Yay, good. But it is what it is. And so um, that, that's what you get when you put those top load wires on the antenna. This is a current distribution. This was done by uh, Mr. Dr. Peter Hansen, uh, 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 that Bill and I know, and, and he was very kind to do some modeling for us to show some examples. So he used a 50-foot tall, quarter-inch diameter wire, no top load. This has now, again, got a very high reactance due to the capacity of reactance of the antenna. He calculated the radiation resistance at 0.18 ohms. So to get one watt out, you have to put 7.4 amps into the antenna base. And in doing so, you can use, again, Ohm's law here. Uh, the voltage is the current times the capacitive reactance. So that antenna will be radiating one watt, but it will have 67,000 volts of R RF on the antenna. Um, now, that sounds awful, but I don't know how many of you have gone out and measured the end of your dipole when you've been running one and a half kilowatts into it and seen how much voltage is out there at the end. You may have 10 kV out there, somewhere 5 to 10 kV. I don't know anyone. I've, I can remember doing this about 20, 30 years ago or more. Uh, some friends and I built a, a wire beam, and uh, I went out with a stick and a fluorescent bulb, and we fired up the 30S1 linear, and you could draw a big flaming arc off the ends of the antenna. So there was kilovolts up there. I don't know how many, but it was, it was, uh, it was a lot. So uh, again, uh, 67 kV with 7 amps flowing into this 50 foot tall antenna. But it's, it, it is. So now let's take the 50 foot tall antenna and put um, the top wires on here. And it's kind of hard to see, but there's a straight, and this is the best you can do with that top load, make it absolutely straight out if you can. And so they've got four top load wires, 50 feet long. It increases the capacitance and lowers that reactance down to 2.5 K ohms. So now our radiation resistance <coughs> is 0.058 ohms. With one watt, it would only take 4.15 amps. And the antenna has dropped down to a very reasonable 10 kV of RF uh, on the antenna. And I know that sounds, but again, uh, running 1,500 watts into a 40 meter dipole out at the end, I, you, may, you may be a half that, you know, I don't know. Any comment on that? Sir? Well, uh, if you do it right, uh, uh, there's, you might, and uh, um, that would be not the greatest thing if you did, but I don't know how, we, we seem to survive it somehow now. Uh, there's probably ways to mitigate it if you did. I know, guaranteed, on those big antennas, like we saw at the beginning, those typically run, um, it just, from what I understand about the maximum voltage you can run on those things is about 250 kV of RF. And um, that's about what the insulator manufacturers, again, at least years ago, could do for you. They could give you a 250 kV insulator. So the antennas were designed with that maximum voltage in mind, you know, when they, when they build them and design them. So again, here's how the current drops off on that 50-foot tall antenna. But here's another one, a little more interesting. This is using a 75-foot tall antenna, one foot in diameter, 
Um, he used four top load wires at 45 degrees. Um, now this is a characteristic. You have this, so, um, when, in, when you start doing the, the sloping of these wires, remember I told you that if it affects your effective height. And so it will decrease your effective height, but it also increases the capacitance. And there's a trade-off you can make in there about that, and people generally do when they use an umbrella antenna. So if you had, uh, if you had very short radials up here, in other words, you weren't affecting the radiation resistance of the antenna by bringing those wires down, the radiation resistance is higher, meaning the antenna is more straight away more efficient. But you've got lower uh, capacitance, and therefore you're going to have higher voltage on it. So you might find that by raising the power in order to get the power uh, that you really wanted out of, or the, uh, that you want out of this thing, uh, you're going to get into a really high voltage. So again, by bringing the, cap the arms down, increasing the capacitance, you can reduce the voltage. So with longer top load radials, the voltage will be less for the same radiated power. So in this one, you had about 0.05 ohms res radiation resistance. Power radiated one watt would take about four and a half amps into the antenna and the voltage would come out to be about 7 kV on the antenna. Here's uh, how the currents drop off on that and how they, they fall off on the radials. Uh, so again, the current going up the tower is somewhat canceled by what's coming back down on the radials. That, that's all uh, been uh, mapped out in this document called Low Frequency Top Loaded Antennas. It was done by the Navy in 66. Uh, it's probably about 50 pages, and they go through every imaginable um, angle, length, number of radials of that top load, and these, these were uh, tested to understand what's the optimum when you want to optimize any of these characteristics. So they have various curves in there. Another document that's out on the web, uh, more than you probably ever wanted to know about LF antennas, was uh, Harold Wheeler. He was... Uh, one of the world's experts on very short antennas. Um, and uh, there's a huge document out there at that URL for, uh, for his papers that he wrote up, and he wrote many IEEE articles uh, on this. So that's about it. We've got... Um, yeah. Sir. Top loading then refers to this capacity, not where the RF comes into the antenna, right? Yeah. That's right. Uh, in all of these pictures, the, uh, and the uh, RF is connected right there. So you, you can put the transmitter there, low output impedance transmitter, clamp it right on there. You, the objective is you have to feed current into that wire putting the transmitter inside the capacitor. Well, you can. I mean, it's... You, you can. If you look back at what Southern... Here's a non-directional beacon. And they did. It, because by the time you... You can do this, but you've got to consider that when you're dealing with these low of radiation resistances, stepping up to 50 ohms, going out to the antenna, stepping it back down, putting transformers in the path, you've got more stuff in the path that you have to worry about the losses on. So, yes, sir. Uh, in the old movies, when you saw the German submarines, they had something that looked like, very much like this, uh, for, for the VLF uh, transmission. I wonder if that's how, that's how they communicated. O on a submarine? Yes, on the submarines. I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I don't... Uh, I, I thought they used maybe ferrite-loaded loops of some kind on those, but uh, I, I don't know, I'd have to see it. I've, in fact, I've got a book that talks all about World War II uh, German submarines uh, radios, so maybe we could look it up. If you yeah. read German, it helps. Uh, qu a quick second question was, Sir. how do they do it now? Oh, you mean to receive? Uh, to receive and transmit on the submarines. They don't transmit low frequency on the submarine. Oh, Braun can tell you. They, they uh, about 17 kilohertz, we only receive. And we can receive down to 150 feet. There, I said that receive antennas are different than the transmit antennas. You can use the transmit antenna as a receive antenna, but uh, you're not going to put any kind of antenna like this uh, and, and be able to, you know, very much successfully use it. Uh, sir. 
being the second submarine enthusiast in the building here, <clears throat> I've read a lot about it, and, and they did NVIS, they operated it at between four and about six or seven megahertz within the Wolf Pack, from the packs back to Germany when they were out in mid-Atlantic. So those they were Asia. Asia. antennas, not LF, receive antennas, yeah. What they did is exactly what the U.S. and, and the Russians are doing, is a one-way receive only. One-way receive only. <coughs> And, and I think that's typically loop antennas probably mounted somewhere on the hull. As that goes back a long ways. Frank had a big, uh, big ferrite rod that he got from some um, from some Danish uh, submarine. Yeah, he had a. a it had a multiple ferrite rods in there, bundled together, to make up. And, uh, and so, yeah, I think I think a ferrite loop. They've been around probably for what about 50 or 60 years. So I don't know what they did back at the beginning of World War II or so for those VLF receive antennas on it. They may have come up and used an E-field. Well, they got, no, I take it back. They got to do something on there. It has to be a loop of some kind that they can have underwater in an in operation underwater. When in pictures of them with loops, I yeah. think you maybe two. We have time for one more question. The guy in the back there, and would you repeat the question when he asks? presentation on this years ago by a, a submarine commander. They use a trailing wire once they get totally fast attacks. That's totally Speak to that better. There's a question with fast attacks. Fast attacks don't re use trailing wires. Only boomers use trailing wires. Only boomers we go too fast. Was that for VLF reception? And okay. ELF. And ELF, yeah. Uh, there are some people operating. 200. Uh, I don't know the answer to all the communication. I think it varies, um, but there's, uh, if you look on the QRZ page, there's a 2200 column in there, and there's people on there that are talking about the antennas that are used. Did you have? Since we're feeding such a low impedance, it, it would make sense to have your transmitter output, the transistor almost tied directly to your feed point? Uh, that's not a bad that. idea at all. It is a very good yeah, idea. What he said was? Drive directly, sir. What he said was? It's for the people that are listening at home. What did you just say? I said, obviously, since we want to drive maximum current into a very low impedance, most of your output transistors, the problem we have with power amplifiers is getting the impedance up high enough to drive your coax. That's right. So, uh, so therefore, so in using a low impedance driver to drive the antenna, in fact, uh, Dr. Hansen, or, uh, uh, um, Yes, uh, that's that's a good way to do it is to have a low impedance driver um, from the. Uh, uh, in fact, I th I don't remember exactly, but I think I was told that the WWVB transmitter is that way. It's a solid state transmitter with a very low output impedance driving the line going out. Now they actually use transmission line out to those WWVB antennas. But yes, uh, somewhere or another, if, you, if you've got the, tra it's like the classic problem, if you have the transmitter a long way from the antennas, you, you somehow ha have to get the power out there. If any of you remember the uh, Annapolis site out there, we'll maybe someday we'll talk about that antenna. It used a wire coming right off of the tuning coil up to the antenna, and it was a very long wire, but there was no transmission line. In fact, in fact, they used three wires going up there because they had to lower the inductance of that uh, wire that fed the antenna, but it actually fed it from the side, and uh, uh, interesting way to do it, but you're absolutely right, a low impedance driver works. Is that it? Okay. Uh, I'm sure there's, there's other questions because this has been a great uh, presentation, and so when we get to the point where we're eating, why don't you guys corner George? and uh, asking the rest of the questions. So thank you very much, George, for that. Okay.